Hey everybody, we got it. Hey Stephanie, little hey. little little mix up on the on the on the stream links, but but we got you here. All righty. Okay. Uh, if you need to go ahead and get your setup to bring in your uh, you're doing a presenting a slideshow, so need right. to get you to bring you know share that in. Okay. Let me go ahead and all right. Uh, all right. Uh, I hit share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Uh, application window. Yes. And then, and then share what? again. Share. And there and it then, is. And no, okay. no, you just shared your screen again. You shared this screen. <laughs> Stop sharing. Yes. All right. So uh, it's just a little technical. Yeah, this is this is kind of weird. It's new. It's new to you, but yeah. All right, application window. There we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. There now, it you, is. All righty. Yeah. Now I just got to start the doggone slideshow, and I'm good. Yeah. yeah, bring it up full screen to for you. There we go. Okie doke. And I will bring that up here, and I will drop out of here and. Of course, let's go ahead and introduce you. We've got Stephanie Osborne, and we're going to throw out the, my three famous questions. Who are you? What do you do? And how the heck did you end up here? <laughs> I'm Stephanie Osborne. I really am one of those rocket scientists you hear about. Uh, these days, I, I spent several decades in the civilian and military space program. I have uh, graduate and undergraduate degrees in astronomy, physics, chemistry, math with some secondary specialties in geology. Um, and these days I'm retired from doing the rocket science mostly, and I write books. And some of those are science fiction, and some of those are science fiction mystery, and some of those are popular science. Um, I, I didn't start off intending to write popular science, uh, but I got invited to do, well, you're not supposed to get ahead of me there, slideshow. Uh, I got invited to do a, a talk about uh, solar and space weather some years back at LibertyCon. And, uh, and that's kind of where Joe Dog and I met, was yeah. at, the, at Liberty. And uh, that, went over, that talk went over so well, everybody was like, can you please turn this into an ebook so so we can see it? Because not everybody got to attend because it was standing room only. Um, and so one thing led to another. And so I started uh, making presenta science presentations and then turning them into popular science ebooks. So if you look at the, the slide right now, over on the right, you see the cover of the ebook that corresponds to this particular okay, talk. Okay, hold on just a second. Don't know what, what happened. You, it changed around. And also, you are now broadcasting on your uh, Stephanie Osborne page Excellent. on Facebook. Yeah, there there we go. Okay. So so the book, the ebook that corresponds with this talk is on the, uh, the right-hand side of the screen. It's called Incoming, the Chicxulub Impactor. And yes, if you look closely, that is a a cheeseburger that the dinosaur is eating. So um, my husband did the cover art. He has a w wicked sense of humor. All right. So let's let's uh, hit a few definitions here real quick, so y'all will know what the heck I'm talking about as we go through this talk. Um, an extinction event is there. There are other terms: mass extinction, biotic crisis, etc. But basically, it is a swift and extensive decrease of biodiversity. Uh, entire species, sometimes entire genera, or entire families get wiped out. Impactite is a rock or a stone produced by meteorite or asteroid impact. Uh, there are various types of impactites, including tektites, shocked minerals, impact obsidian, melts, partial melts, uh, and sedimentary rocks containing any of the above. Turbidites are stones that are formed from the sediment that has been turned into a slurry. Uh, and then as 
due to the, the turbidity of the water or the fluid that it's suspended in. And then when the turbidity settles, the, the, all these, these sediments of different sizes uh, settle out. And so you wind up with, instead of the normal uh, separated, you know, heaviest stuff on the bottom, lightest stuff on the top, it's just all kind of muddled up together. Uh, a bolide, um, you've probably all seen one. It's a shooting star that becomes extremely bright and sometimes even looks like it explodes. This is because it generally does. This thing is going ahead of me here. Um, and so you may or may not have fragments reaching the ground depending on how up the explosion occurs. Uh, but basically, the explosion occurs due to thermal stresses within the meteor. Um, since I can only see my, my screen, if anybody has any questions, I'll need it vocalized to me. I'll need somebody to read the question. Okay? Uh, KT boundary. Yes, ma'am. We got you. We got you. Okay. Okay. KT boundary stands for Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary. The K stands for Cretaceous. The T stands for tertiary. They'd already used C for one of the other one of the other eras or periods. Uh, unfortunately, this is this is what it's most well known by. It's not the current term because somewhere along the way they decided to change the name of the tertiary period to the Paleogene. So now it's the KPG boundary. I don't know of anybody that calls it that. It doesn't pronounce nearly as well as KT, so I'm going to call it KT. <laughs> oh, come on. Quit going ahead of me here. Uh, the Mesozoic era is the age of the dinosaurs and the conifers, ranging from about 262 million years before the present to about 66 million years ago. It consists of the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. Yes, Jurassic Park. Yeah, you got it. The Cretaceous period is uh, the, the very last period of the Mesozoic era, uh, started about 145 million years ago and ran to 66 million years ago. The Maastrichtian age was the last age in the Cretaceous. Uh, this, this is running up to, to the extinction event. The Cenozoic era is the era we're currently living in. It is the modern age, the age of mammals and humans. Uh, its very first period was the the tertiary. Yeah, okay, battery. Yeah. Should have thought about that. Uh, its very first period was the tertiary, now known as the Paleogene, uh, started at the extinction event and ran up to about 23 million years ago. Archosaurs. Of the ruling reptiles, that's the oldest category of reptiles, and it includes all dinosaurs, pterosaurs, crocodilians, birds, and actually most modern reptiles. So it is a very overarching uh, category. Um, ammonoids, specifically ammonites, these are uh, cephalopods, and they are the entire ammonoid group is extinct, but they are distantly related to, and some of them look a lot like the modern Nautilus. It, you, you'd think it would be a direct connection, but evidently it's not. Um, I don't claim to cl classify these things. I just I just tell you like it is. Um, then there are belemnoids, which is another extinct group of cephalopods. Those are fairly closely related to modern octopi and squid, but they had shells. Bivalves still exists. Uh, these are mollusks. They are the, the classic uh, double, double shelled mollusks that we're used to seeing like clams and scallops, uh, oysters, etc. So these are all going to be discussed in the course of, these are all creatures that were affected by the KT boundary extinction event. Crocodilians, well, we have crocodilians today. Those are the, the reptile, the branch that contains modern crocodiles and alligators. 
Uh, for those that, that are interested uh, in such things, uh, believe it or not, here in Huntsville, Alabama, where I am, uh, we, we have, um, I'm not that far from the Tennessee River, and there was actually, somebody ran over a gator uh, coming into work the other morning. Um, the gator was out in the middle of the road, and it was dark, and he didn't see him, and ka -dump -bump. So, yeah, I, I have some, some knowledge of the things. Uh, 4Ms, the, these are basically plankton. Um, they're single-celled organisms with, they typically have a lot of long pseudopods around a central shell-enclosed body. Uh, they're usually microscopic, but they can get bigger. Uh, I, know, I know guys that, that their specialty was studying 4Ms. And if you, you can actually date a rock stratum by the specific 4Ms to be found in them. So they would actually take a piece of rock, slice it down incredibly thin, and shove it under a microscope and see what they could find. And this was how they would date the rock, was determining what 4Ms were in it. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. It, I, I really didn't like the, the, uh, the eye strain it produced, but anyway. So then we have uh, Anoceramus, a uh, genus of extinct clams. A pseudopod references things like 4Ms and, and, and stuff like that. It's a protrusion from the surface of the cell for the purpose of either moving around or feeding. Amoebas develop pseudopods. Uh, reclining life habit, these are a kind of bivalve lifestyle. Uh, they're more they're more sedentary. They don't move around a lot, um, and so that leads to uh, whatever half of the shell that they're lying on tends to atrophy, and the other half tends to get thicker because they need it for protection. <clears throat> um, sometimes they they for, even formed spiral shells. Uh, cephalopods, another class of mollusk, including octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and nautilus as well as all of those extinct versions. Um, again, we have another variety of plankton. <clears throat> they, they create shells, and so these get the, deposited when that creature dies into the, the silt on the bottom of the ocean floor. And so, again, we can find them in the, the sediment and in the, the rock strata, and sometimes we can date it by those. All right. About 66 million years ago, some 80% of all species on Earth became extinct. Those are land, those are shallow marine, those are deep marine. 80% of all species went extinct. That included virtually all of the dinosaurs, with the sole exception of those that led to modern birds and crocodilians. And virtually all the shallow marine invertebrates. So... As paleontologists studied the ge as paleontologists studied the geological record, uh, they usually sliced down through it and created cross sections, and they discovered that there was a huge die off between strata at the boundary. So basically, you had all these creatures in the rocks below the boundary, older than the boundary, and none at all above it, especially immediately above it. But every time anywhere on the planet they found the boundary between the, the Cretaceous and the Tertiary periods, there was always, always this odd layer of clay. It varied in thickness from place to place on the planet. But then they started analyzing the clay and they discovered that it had a very high level of, some, of an element called iridium. Now, Louis and Walter Alvarez were two of the main um, uh, investigators on this. They were father-son. Uh, you have on the, the right-hand picture, Louis Alvarez is on the left, and Walter's on the right. And Walter actually has his fingertips on the KT boundary clay layer. That, that dark, thin, dark line there is, is that clay. Uh, they're not quite who you'd expect for scientists investigating an extinction. 
Luis Alvarez is actually a fairly famous physicist. Uh, he he was he's been awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. He worked in the Manhattan Project. Um, he's he's done all kinds of of work. Uh, he he helped uh, develop radar. Uh, he were he was actually aboard the Enola Gay when it dropped Little Boy on Hiroshima because he wanted to measure the shock wave and try to figure out the yield of the blast, et cetera, et cetera. He wound up um, working for what be later became Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, during the war, Walter was born. And uh, Louis continued work at UC Berkeley after the war. Uh, by the 1970s, Walter was himself a, a well-known scientist, but he chose geology. And so he was in Italy exploring the KT boundary. Uh, and he was really, really puzzled because nobody could figure out the reason for the mass extinction that was found there. So he came home for, for uh, a visit. And over dinner one night, he was discussing the whole thing with, with dad, Louis. And Louis got interested and brought in some of his colleagues from Lawrence Berkeley, uh, Frank Azaro and Helen Michelle. Now, the name Azaro might mean something to you if you're a science fiction fan, and I expect most of the people listening to me are, because Frank is the father of Catherine Azaro, the uh, science fiction author. Anyway, Frank and Helen analyzed the clay uh, chemically, and they were the ones who discovered the high iridium content. Now, the thing that you need to realize about iridium is that iridium doesn't occur very much on Earth. And that's what made it interesting. Not only that, but it turned out that the, the isotopes of iridium found in the clay don't match the common ratio of iridium isotopes normally found on Earth. So, you know, they published it and they began to uh, speculate that it might have been an impact uh, that caused the extinction and laid down this, this clay that is so high in iridium. Now, this, uh, this was kind of an interesting situation because after they published the article, they also started finding other things in the clay as they analyzed it more in depth. They found a tremendous amount of soot. They found tiny glassy spheres. They found shocked quartz crystals. They found microscopic diamonds. And they found some extremely rare minerals that are only formed under conditions of great temperature and pressure. So they're almost never found on the surface. Uh, you might be able to find a few if you uh, were able to get down uh, to the mantle. And so here's a little bit, uh, it's a larger image of the one I showed you earlier. So you can see a little bit that, that level of clay. And you can see there, it's, it's, it's not really thick. Um, it's, it's kind of a dark brownish green. Um, and, and again, this is in Italy. Now, the paper was published in 1980, and it didn't go over well. It turns out, if you've ever studied geology, you may have been introduced to the debate between uniformitarianism and catastrophism. This was a huge debate in geology for since, I guess, around the Victorian era and running in well into uh, and through the 20th century. The idea there was that there were two conflicting theories behind how geological processes occurred. Uniformitarianism held that everything occurred slowly and gradually and things eroded and nothing happened very fast. And catastrophism said that 
No, we have earthquakes. We have volcanic eruptions. Everything occurs quickly and suddenly. And you have a change. And then you have a long period of time with nothing. And then you have a change. And then you have a long period of time with nothing. And then you have a change. And like most things, neither one was right. It's somewhere in the middle. Unfortunately, uh, Louis died in 1988 before the matter could be resolved. Um, and in fact, there are still people who argue it. Enter these two guys. Glenn Penfield and Antonio Camargo Zanaguera. Uh, Glenn and Antonio. <laughs> now, who are they? Well, they're petrogeophysicists, and they worked for the Mexican petroleum company Pemex. And they were prospecting for oil in and around the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they were looking for offshore uh, oil rig drilling sites. And instead, they found a gigantic arc out through the Gulf of Mexico with what Penfield referred to as extraordinary symmetry. It was roughly a semicircle about 45, 40 miles in diameter. It was much too symmetric for a volcanic crater. Never mind, that would be a, that would be, oh geez, that would be a crater that would be bigger than the Yellowstone caldera. So, uh, it, it did have a magnetic field, a, a paleomagnetic field embedded in the rock. Uh, and that field shape did not match any known volcanic structures. So he dug up a 1960s era gravity map of the area that Pemex had commissioned. And uh, basically what, what many people that don't work in this field don't realize is gravity is not uniform over the surface of the Earth. Anytime you have what's called a mass con, a mass concentration produced by denser rock, uh, or a less dense rock, you get variations in the localized gravity. And so these gravity maps, these, these gravity variation maps called Bouguet anomaly maps, uh, can tell us a lot about the underlying structure below ground. And so when they dug up the Bouguet anomaly map for the region, they discovered that there was another arc on land on the, the uh, Yucatan Peninsula, and it made the other half of the circle. Um, and so they began, it, it, they, Pemex knew about this as early as the 1950s, uh, but they didn't really care about the geology, they just wanted to know if there was oil there. So in the 60s, they began drilling into this ring-like structure. Now mind you, this is 1978, when, Penn, when Glenn and Antonio came up with it, rediscovered it, if you will. But in the 1960s, Pemex was drilling into this ring structure and taking core samples looking for oil. And this continued on into the 70s. And uh, one of their contractors had begun suspecting that it was an impact site. But Pemex corporate policy uh, wouldn't let him publicize this idea because it was all considered uh, company confidential. So, when the Alvarezes came out with their paper in 1980, after, uh, after uh, the Penfield and, and his partner uh, discovered the, the impact site in 1978, Penfield wrote to them, uh, and explained what they had found in the Yucatan and got no response. Evidently, it got lost in the mail or who knows. And so the next year, 1981, the, the two uh, geophysicists reported the findings to the Society of, the Explore Society of Exploration Geophysicists uh, annual meeting. And they proposed that it might be the same crater for which the Alvarezes were searching. Um, that wasn't quite the end of the story. You, you might think it would be, but it, it wasn't because, uh, their, their 
are many today who do not believe that the extinction event was called by an impact, caused by an impact. So things started to happen, however, at that point. Uh, so what is the evidence? Well, you have that Bouguer gravity anomaly. You have a magnetic anomaly associated with it. You have the iridium abundance in the clay layer. Uh, you have the fact that there's no difference in the composition of the clay uh, that would have been laid down underwater, like at the bottom of the ocean, versus that that was laid down on land. Yes, vol some volcanoes do emit increased iridium, but it's, it's brought up from, from the mantle, uh, but the isotope ratios are different, uh, as well as the ratio to other heavy metals. They, they found in this same region, they found volcanic breccias. Now, a breccia is a, broke, is, is a sedimentary stone in which broken rock fragments have been cemented together. Now, sedimentary, they occur in sedimentary and they occur in volcanic forms. Sedimentary breccias are usually cemented by uh, calcium carbonate deposits. Volcanic breccias are cemented by lava. So they were finding volcanic breccias, broken rock cemented together by lava. They also were finding shock metamorphic material. This is material that's been distorted by the shock of impact. Um, I'm not going to go through a whole bunch of those. I am going to show you what they look like uh, shortly. Uh, one of the important features, however, is a shatter cone. This is a fan-shaped three-dimensional structure in rock. Uh, it's it's a it's a fracture uh, caused by high pressure, and the the point of the cone points in the direction that the pressure wave is coming from. So they they are they have only ever been found at the site of an impact or a nuclear detonation. It takes that much pressure to form them. Uh, shocked quartz, uh, uh, a quartz crystal whose crystalline structure has been deformed by the pressure wave. Uh, Brazil twinning when the quartz, two adjacent quartz crystals actually merge because they partly melted and resolidified. Uh, and then something called tectite, tectites. Uh, tectite is a kind of obsidian produced by the melting of the impactor and crater material. Uh, it tends to rapidly cool in the atmosphere, which means it forms a glass rather than a crystal. And it, they usually form aerodynamic shapes such as teardrops. Uh, there are some numerous uh, tectites found all over the earth. There are only two that I'm aware of that actually have, uh, they're, they're pretty enough to be considered gemstones. And one of those is known as Libyan Desert Glass, which is a very pretty yellow. Uh, the, best, the best quality is a very pretty clear yellow. Uh, and it was actually used in, uh, by some of the pharaohs in their jewelry. And the other is a lovely green, um, and it's called Moldavite. And it's in the, the it's near the Moldau River in Eastern uh, Europe, uh, and those to me those are the more interesting because of the shapes of the raw pieces. That it's 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 kind of fluted lace like, and nobody really understands why it's that shape. They found a lot of those, a lot of of tectites. Usually tectites are just kind of a black, kind of a black brown bubbly thing. They also found turbidite deposits. Remember, we talked about those. Um, and they found spherules, uh, tiny, tiny little spheres of feldspar. Uh, they found os osmium, which is another rare element that normally is not found on the surface of Earth. Uh, and they found it with the isotopes in cosmic ratios. Uh, Car the carbon isotope evidence indicates that plankton synthesis virtually halted at that point. Uh, they found not just iridium and osmium, but lots and lots of all of the platinum group of metals. Uh, but none of them had terrestrial 
ratios. They all had cosmic ratios. Gold, platinum, osmium, iridium, all of these. Um, and they, they have found this in other regions of the planet associated with impact structures, such as the Ackerman Crater in Australia. Fossil pollen, believe it or not, if you use a microscope, you can find fossilized pollen in rock. I don't like the eye strain. Uh-uh, ain't going there. But they discovered that the fossilized pollen just stopped at that clay layer. You can find it below the clay layer. Above it, you have to go several strata up before you start seeing any more fossil, fossilized pollen. Uh, they found a tremendous amount of shocked quartz in the layer in Montana. And expert geologist Bevan French concluded that, therefore, the impact likely occurred within 3,500 miles of the Montana site. Uh, the distribution of the ejecta seems to decrease with increasing distance from the Yucatan, which thereby points to the Yucatan as the site of origin. And basically, um, scientists have concluded that 79% of, of con plants contemporary with the time went extinct at the KT boundary. Uh, there are, as I mentioned earlier, very high concentrations of soot in that clay layer, which kind of tells you what it might have happened to the plants. And if you look at the crater on the map, if you look at the Yucatan Peninsula, you, can, you find that something called cenotes, uh, basically usually water-filled sinkholes, line and define the rim of the crater on the peninsula. And this all occurred, this was all discovered within the first 10 years after the Alvarez, Alvarez, Asaro, and Michelle paper was released. Got any questions? I'm going to stop and drink some water. Any questions so far? All right. No questions. Okay. Okay. I did find you a pretty picture of your crater, though. Artist rendition. Oh, okay. Hang on just a second. Uh, let's see. Uh, do I need to stop shit? Uh, nope. I'll, I'll get it, actually. Sorry about that. My mic was muted. No, we don't have any questions. What I was going to say is everybody... I had taken my headphones off to work on something. Uh sorry about that have you already got all the way through Stephanie? oh no oh no oh, I just, okay I just, I just took a break so i can sip some water oh okay uh yeah um yeah uh we've got a slight programming change there isn't going to be a seven o'clock panel so we're working to figure out what to do i'm working oh. behind the scenes so okay uh, um so you know, slight programming change, but we'll find something. So, okay. you know, everybody watching, don't panic. We will have something. <laughs> let, me, let me know if I can help out. Okay, uh, I'll give you that holler. But yeah, uh, just continue on, John. If you would uh, help monitor the room, and if anybody asks any questions, okay. uh, Carl Whitson says you're all good so far. So okay, uh, everybody. Carl, Everybody understanding me okay? Yeah. Is everybody understanding and picking up? Sounds what fine. Saying? Looks good. Yeah. Yeah. All okay. right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back out of here, guys. Okay. okay. And moving right along. Da -da -dum, da -da -dum. Da -da -dum. Yes, I love the okay. Muppets. That, that is a picture of, it's kind of a uh, artist impression of what the Yucatan crater would have looked like after the impact. And you can see the coastline running right up to the, um, let me do this. You can see the coastline running right up to the middle of it. And these are the two, and those are the two different rings that supposedly were created. And that's when she was talking about the uh, the pools and puddles that were formed. Yeah, that was, uh, I guess, essentially this area. And I'm I'm gonna gonna show some maps and things like that here shortly. Uh, I just I wanted to, to throw all this out there so people would have it in their heads when I started showing the imagery and stuff. 
but I, I want to see that. I, right now, I've got my, my uh, slideshow up, so it's filling my screen, so I can't see that. Okay. But, but, oh, uh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep a track of it and show it to you later. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Now, um, here's some additional important evidence that came out after that first 10 years. So, see, there's still, uh, there's still evidence that is continuing to be found even today. Um, so, the Deccan Traps are a kind of were a kind of super volcano. Um, there's two kinds of super volcanoes. Um, one is is called a trap, and the other is called a caldera, mega caldera. Uh, mega calderas tend to be explosive. Traps tend to be what's called effusive. Uh, the the lava is thin and runny, and it, it they will open up in vast fields of parallel cracks and just ooze incredible amounts of lava all over the landscape. Uh, the Deccan traps were in were about this time frame uh, over in what later became what is now India, and just laid out just literally millions of cubic miles of lava in four separate major er ongoing eruptions. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, it, it erupted for a couple of days and it stopped. No, this was like, it erupted for several years and then it stopped. And then later on, it erupted for several more years and then it stopped. Um, so it did this four times. Um, some people say that no, 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 no. The Deccan traps were the cause of the of the eruption uh, of the extinction. Well, no, because it turns out that the, an intertrapian layer is a layer of sediment laid down in between trap eruptions. So you have a layer of lava, and then you'll have layers of sediment, and you have another layer of lava, and then layers of sediment. So the layers of lava are the trapian layers. And the layers of sediment are the intertrapian layers. Is in an intertrapian layer. <clears throat> it's not. It, it's 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 not immediately after the lava. It's not after the the traps erupted. So you've got ongoing stuff looking fairly normal up until you have this this boundary layer, and then bluey nothing. And then you go on for a little ways and you have another lava layer. So that seems to indicate to me that the Deccan traps probably are not the cause of the extension. And they were, in fact, erupting for a considerable time prior to the extinction because, see, that would be, that would mean they've had at least three eruptions prior to. Dead gimmick, why is it running ahead of me? Now, the, the osmium isotope layers have been, uh, ratios have been studied considerably um, for uh, the last 80 million years. Now, by that, <laughs> I don't mean that we've been studying them for 80, 80 million years. I mean, the last 80 million years of sediments of strata have been studied for the osmium isotope ratios. All of the osmium ratios are terrestrial, except for the KT layer. If you were to take all of the iridium in all of the modern oceans put together, you'd have about one one thousandth, one one thousandth that is that is found in the KT clay layer. There is a thousand times more iridium in that thin little clay layer worldwide than you can find in all of the modern oceans together. If you were to take it all out of the oceans, you'd have a thousand times more in that clay layer. They found shocked zircon crystals. Um, and unlike others found elsewhere in the geologic strata, these shocked zircon crystals were extremely deficient in lead. And what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, lead 
of all metals has an extremely low melting point. It also has an extremely low vaporization point. So if you had an impact, it's an, <clears throat> an impact or a nuke are about the only two things that could vaporize the lead out of a zircon crystal. And they're just finding more and more that there's just tremendous numbers of tiny little microscopic diamonds found at the boundary layer. Now, diamonds are not found on the surface of the earth. They are not produced on the surface of the earth. If you find a diamond on the surface, it's because you are standing in what used to be a volcano. And that volcano brought the diamond up from the mantle. So stop and think about that for a minute. Takes a lot of pressure to form a diamond. Now in 2016, uh, there was a drilling project into the peak ring. And by the way, the, the impact site is known as the Chicxulub crater or the Chicxulub impact uh, impactor. And uh, because Chicxul it's, it's a little fishing village on the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula that's very, very close to what would have been the center of the, the impact. It's very close to the center of the, of the crater. And so this drilling uh, project confirmed that the peak ring was made up of granite unlike anything normally seen in the crust. It wasn't normal seafloor rock which would have been sedimentary. Uh, it comprised granite ejected from the mantle. Um, there was also evidence of just colossal seawater movement afterwards. Now, the thing that you have to remember about the seawater movement is that at the time of the impact, and we know there was an impact there, uh, the argument is just whether or not it caused the extinction event. Uh, at the time of the impact, that area was underwater. That area was a seafloor. It was a shallow sea, but it was a seafloor. Um, the core samples also showed a, a virtually complete absence of the mineral gypsum. <clears throat> and that's uh, the usual seafloor rock in the region. And it contains sulfates. But sulfates, uh, like lead, are, have a, a low melting point. They would have been vaporized and dispersed as an aerosol into the air. Uh, additional drilling research showed that there were multiple episodes of overwash of the crater as, as, the, sea, as the water came back in and washed over it in multiple waves. And the, the amount of impactites uh, that were deposited in the, the floor of the crater were, were just uh, astounding. Uh, that, that granite that they found was pink. Um, that's normally found deep in the crust down near the, the mantle. Um, and that indicates very deep it, it, uh, penetration of the impactor. That impactor very nearly cracked the crust. Um, and the, the, there just wasn't any gypsum there. Now, here's some pictures for you. This is, this are the types of things that they were found. These are some of the things that I was showing you earlier. All right, suavite is a type of impact breccia. You see those dark uh, uh, angular rocks? Those are the broken rocks. And then the lighter rock in between is the lava that, that cemented it all together. The largest fragments are nine inches across, folks. Nearly a foot across. That's some honking big chunks of rock. Uh, the center top. That's what a shatter cone looks like. You see how it's pointed off to, all of them are pointed off to the right. 
that that means that the pressure wave from the impact came from the right and translated through the rock and just broke the rock all to pieces. Come on now, stop this. Um, top right, this is what shocked quartz looks like. If you're if you're looking at it with a uh, um, polarized light, and you can see that you've got uh, what's called shock lamellae, which are the, the layers of uh, as as the the pressure wave moved through the crystal, it distorted and shifted the crystal structure. And then um, bottom left, praseolite is a variation of amethyst. It's, it's a quartz crystal. Praseolite is usually slightly green to very green. Uh, but you don't see that here because we're, once again, we're looking at crossed polarized light. Um, and so you can see that there are effectively two separate crystals there. This is what's known as a Brazil twin, where the, 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 The effect on the crystal was effect was essentially to partly melt it and cause the two adjacent adjacent crystals as they gradually recrystallize to merge. Except that we can see that they didn't quite merge, so they're twins. Think of them as as conjoined twins, if you will, in the in the uh, crystal world. All right. Up close and personal with the clay. All right, what you see there in that little sample is four distinct layers. You see a very pale cream color on the bottom. Then you see a, a greenish brown, then a dark brown, then a light brown. If you look at that greenish brown layer uh, just above his fingertip there as he's pointing to it, that is the iridium clay. That's the KT boundary clay. Now, this is an actual map which includes the coastline of the Yucatan. So that's the northwest coast. It includes the gravity anomaly and it includes a map of the cenotes as the white, little white dots. So you can see, unfortunately, I can't point to it, but you can see two. Uh, you can see one ring, smaller ring. You can see that there's a bit of a, of a peak in the center. You can see on land um, a semicircle outer ring. Uh, the rest of the ring was probably uh, eroded by the, the wash of the ocean. Um, and you'll notice that if you look very, very closely, you can see that outer semicircle. Um, all of the cenotes are in and around that semicircle or moving out from it. Uh, probably weaknesses generated by the shock waves. So we're not entirely sure why the cenotes are so closely associated with the ring. Um, if I had to put an educated guess on it, I'd say that the underlying rock structures were weakened and fractured and enabled, since, since a cenote is basically a sinkhole, um, it probably enabled uh, additional weathering uh, along the, uh, the fracture lines. And so you wound up with more cenotes concentrated in the area of the fractures. And what, uh, what this picture doesn't show you is that there is a series of parallel faults off to the right um, that were apparently produced, uh, they're associated with the crater and apparently produced by the impact. And it is 
in that general direction where the 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 rest of the cenotes are occurring there in that image. And here's a here's a larger scale map that that shows you what I'm talking about. Uh, the blue is the outer ring where the cenotes are. The crater center is there, essentially right on the coast uh, near the little town of Chicxulub. And there was virtually continuous ejecta uh, out to the the uh, dotted yellow ring. And you can see numerous fracture and fault zones there, most likely produced by the impact, um, as well as several e exploratory expeditions that did drill cores and the like, uh, and the, the sites there. Now, let's talk about the impactor for a minute. It was undoubtedly a very large bolide of some sort. Um, I have a range of velocities, diameters, and masses depending on exactly what the impactor was composed of. Uh, you, the, the options are uh, nickel iron meteorite or asteroid, stony asteroid, or comet material, comet fragment. And so you're looking at uh, a velocity uh, of anywhere from 2,800 up to over 16,000 miles an hour. Uh, that latter is, is, is reasonable for going to the moon. Um, estimated diameter of anywhere uh, from around 10 kilometers or about 6 miles up to about 50 miles wide. Uh, we generally tend to trend. We think that it was on the lower end of that. Um, and we're looking at anywhere from two with 15 zeros after it up to a one with 18 zeros after it if you want to estimate the mass in pounds. Not small. Now, efforts are have been made to try to figure out what family of asteroids it might have been from when I say family, what do I mean? Well, it turns out that we can group most asteroids into families um, based on their apparent composition, their their apparent orbits, um, their their uh, physical characteristics like brightness, reflectivity, mass, things like that. Um, and it's believed that each family of asteroids probably originated from one one or two much larger asteroids that collided. So they, they, they collided and broke up. And so each family of asteroids uh, would, would track back to one of these collisions. So the Baptistina family of asteroids is one possibility for the Chicxulub impactor's origin. But uh, the best estimate we have currently for that collision that produced the Baptistina family is about 14 million years earlier than the KT impact. And while we might think 14 million years is a long time, that actually isn't that long for the shatter fragments to expand out and the orbits to sync up sufficient for one of the fragments to impact Earth. Um, a better option would make it part of the flora family, and this would tend to place the impactor on the smaller, slower, more massive end of the range. So that would make it um, about a 2,800 mile an hour, um, six mile wide impactor um, with about 10 to the 18th uh, pounds contained within it. Um, there is a possibility that it could have been a comet. However, uh, the iridium uh, um, abundance in comets is only about half of what is usually found in asteroids. Um, and so they actually sat down and tried to 
determine the amount of iridium in the KT layer and figure that out. And so comets being much less dense, uh, it would have had to have been much larger and much faster. Uh, they typically are falling in from the Oort cloud out past Pluto as opposed to the asteroid belt. Um, and so you'd get something that was moving a lot faster, would be a lot bigger, and would probably be somewhat less massive. But the current probability based on, on all the data that they've been able to pull out so far is that it was an asteroid. Uh, the impact itself, you're talking about something that uh, the energy of impact was um, uh, over 100,000 gigatons. And when you consider that the biggest nuke we've ever detonated was only 50 megatons, uh, you're looking at um, an event that was 2 million times more powerful than the biggest nuke we've ever been able to build. Um, we don't know for sure how deep that crater is because all of the material backwashed and filled it in. It may be as deep as 30 miles or better. Um, it was over 100 miles across. It may have been closer to 200. And you're looking at a temperature at the center of impact uh, very close to 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit not something that you'd want to be anywhere close to. It would have generated uh, winds around 600 miles an hour, give or take. The air blast damage radius would have been over 1,100 miles. And the sound that it made when it hit would have been well over 100 decibels. Since it landed in water, it would have generated a mega tsunami from the splash. And we're looking at anywhere from uh, over 150 feet up to 1,000 feet. And it may have gone at least in areas as high as a mile high. And I'm talking about a wall of water, people. The estimated inland reach of that initial mega tsunami was at least 100 kilometers. Um, the depth of sand deposit uh, in the crater area from the backwash is at least 100 meters. So you're looking at 300 to 425 feet of sand backwashed into the crater. Um, there is evidence uh, that uh, from a paper that was not yet published, I need to verify whether or not it ever got published. Um, evidently, all ocean basins were affected by this initial mega tsunami. And it then reflected and refla refracted around the land masses. Uh, for those of you that may remember the December 2004 uh, Boxing Day tsunami in the Indian Ocean, 2,600 times more powerful than that sucker. And that was only the initial mega tsunami. The initial quake would have been estimated at greater than a magnitude 10, possibly as high as 11 or 12. And that would in turn have generated titanic underwater landslides, which would in their turn have generated secondary mega tsunamis. It would also have generated seismic seiches around the world. A seiche is a, a localized wave similar to a tsunami, but it's it's kind of a bathtub slosh. Think of it as, well, you've seen them, you've probably seen videos of a seiche setting up in swimming pools in California where they slop out of the sides of the, of the swimming pools. That's a seiche. Those will occur not just in man-made bodies of water like swimming pools, they will occur in lakes and rivers and ponds and streams, uh, usually generated by the arrival of, of earthquake waves. So if we extrapolate 
from the 2011 quake in Tohoku, Japan, which was a magnitude nine, and it generated about a five foot sash, we can estimate that the seiches that the Chipsalub earthquake uh, generated were on the order of anywhere from 33 up to over 300 feet high. Uh, Tanis is a site in the Dakotas that has been much studied for this. It is a KT extinction event uh, site and it was very near a creek, Hell Creek, and they estimate that the sage there was at least 10 meters. Meter is a little bit more than a, than a yard, so probably around 35 feet high. At the time that the impact occurred, North America was actually two continents. There was a, a seaway, a, a broad seaway that went down uh, diagonally from roughly the Gulf, we'll say the Gulf of Mexico up to uh, towards, towards the Northwest. Um, and so it probably, the sage probably occurred in the Western Interior Seaway and the Hell Creek uh, spilled into the seaway. So it probably just backwashed up the creek. The, the area of impact was extremely rich in hydrocarbons and sulfur compounds. Um, the estimated burned carbon from those hydrocarbons that would have been injected into the stratosphere was on the order of 1,800 to 6,000 teragrams. Uh, you can work out, you know, it's uh, uh, upwards of 65, let's see, what is it? Six and a half billion tons of carbon. And that would have been just from the hydrocarbons, the petroleum. It doesn't count the sulfur combustion products. And it doesn't count what happened to the plants around the world. So you're looking at trillions of tons of greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere by this impact. Um, there were, in the core samples in the peak ring, the topmost layer of debris um, contained a lot of organic material and the very top of that organic material was charcoal. And that's an indication that there were widespread firestorms. So in the aftermath, there would have been also a nuclear winter produced by the ejecta, the debris injected into the stratosphere that blocked the sunlight, Vol volcanic quote unquote ash, because it really wasn't a volcano, but it would have been of a similar composition, plus smoke from the wildfires. So anything that any any photosynthetic plants that survived the wildfires would have died from the lack of sunlight. And this then would have produced a cascade of extinction up through the herbivores, then to the carnivores, and eventually to the scavengers. Uh, some of the stratospheric material was in the form of sulfur compounds. As this gradually settled and began to fall out of the atmosphere, it would have formed acid rain. And you, so you wind up you wind up with nitrogen and oxygen reacting from the energy of impact, forming nitric acid. So now you have sulfuric and nitric acid forming falling out of the sky. Um, the oceans rapidly acidified as a result, uh, particularly the shallow waters. Uh, marine ecology collapsed. Uh, the forams and the plankton died off. And just the very initial rebound would have taken tens of thousands of years to recover. And to get back to something approximating normal would have been potentially millions of years. 
Now, this next bit here is uh, something that I compiled. And I hope it is uh, understandable to you. I color-coded it. Uh, I put together a timeline of events for the impact. Uh, if it's orange, this is ground zero. This is Chicxulub itself. If it is white, it's about a thousand kilometers from the impact or around about the distance of New Orleans from the Yucatan. If it's yellow, this is the Tannis site in North Dakota. That's that distance. And if it is gray, it is a worldwide event. Um, so hopefully you can, you can get a feel for that. For what it's worth, uh, Chattanooga is a little bit further than New Orleans. So it's just over a thousand miles, but you can take the New Orleans information uh, and apply it to Chattanooga. So at T minus zero, we have impact. Yeah. Hey, Stephanie, yep. right before you get into this, we got a few questions. Do you want to take a break? Get, get you a yeah. sip of water and uh, ask a couple quick questions real quick. Go for it. Okay. Uh, let's roll back up here. Uh, Carl Whitsman, who is one of our great benefactors here. Uh, of course, Stephanie Osborne or Ruth Jackson says, yay, Stephanie, absolute favorite rocket scientist and weather reporter. <laughs> but Carl Whitsman says he almost became a paleontologist at one time, ended up uh, becoming an IT specialist. Well, there's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And talking about the angle of the impact, he says mm -hmm. it was almost like a bullet hit hitting the earth. There was almost no angle in the impact. Um, in, in case you can't hear, I have a cat trying to help answer the questions. Yes, I've noticed oh. that. <laughs> <laughs> he's part Siamese, so he's loud. Yeah. Um, it that's that is still being debated. It's it's a relatively round crater. So yeah, it's it's um. The, it, it would seem to me to be that it was a relatively uh, high angle of impact, very nearly 90 degrees. Uh, others have argued that it was a much shallower impact, more like 45 degrees or so. Um, but it's been my experience those tend to produce more elliptical, more oval-shaped mm. uh, craters than, than this one is. So that that is still still under debate. Just like there's still people debating that um, this uh, was not the cause of, of the uh, extinction event. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I would take it as being a relatively high angle uh, of impact. Okay. So pretty much it will it coming into the atmosphere. There was, you know, of course, it, you know, nothing was survivable, but but it there wouldn't have been much more than a bright flash before the boom. Yeah. The, uh, the, the asteroid would barely have noticed the atmosphere. It would have no, would not have noticed the water at all. The okay. first thing it would, the first thing it would have noticed would have been bang into the rock. Yeah. And, uh, Chris Walker, when you were describing, you know, the size of the impact, uh -huh. He goes, dang, that was a lot of kinetic energy. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Could that possibly be where our tilt came from? Where our what? Our planetary tilt? Uh, no, that would have been in existence. That was more than likely mostly in existence when the planet formed. Okay. Um, th remember that this was far and away from being the first impact. That, yeah. that Earth has had. And in fact, the moon is probably the result of a of a plan of, of two planets colliding. That's probably that's probably where the tilt came from. From that one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh of course Chris Walker is talking about Carl. Uh he traded one type of silicone for another. 
<laughs> yeah. I um, have I have uh my my husband brought me a new headset. Oh, I lost okay. my old headset, guys, just a couple of days ago. Um, so I'm gonna try plugging it in and see how, seeing how it works. Okay. All right. So y'all just bear with me a second here. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, while you're doing that, I'm going to run a little quick commercial. How's that sound? That works. Uh, and it'll also mute you down. Let me find the commercial. I'm sort of proud of this commercial because it's for Halicon's merchandise. And we're back. Do you think that got it? Uh, test one, two, test one, two. Oh, man, you sound a whole lot better now. Okay. All right. Good deal. That Do I, am I loud enough? Oh, yes. You're actually louder. Do I need Same. to be loud? You look like you're back in mission control. <laughs> it feels kind of like it, too. Yeah. Okay. How's that? Yeah, it sounds great. Okay. All right. We're going we're gonna to drop can back you, out. Can you hear us? That's yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. All right. We're going to jump back out and let Stephanie continue her panel. She's got uh, about another 45 minutes that she can kill. Or when you get to the end, we'll start really asking for questions and everything okay. else. How does that sound? All right. Sounds good. All, All right, right. So let's get into the timeline that I put together. Now, now mind this timeline, some of it um, I was able to pull from online references uh, some of it I had to calculate uh, based on some some rough estimates, why, especially uh, the various earthquake waves, um, because you know the the seismic waves travel at different velocities depending on the material they're traveling through. So what I would try to do was take a rough average of the range of speeds of each given type of wave and the distance and do a rough calculation so some of this is it, it, it's it's approximate all right so at uh time t0 impact uh, we have a crater blasted about 30 miles deep five seconds later the central peak has rebounded upward temporarily forming a mountain higher than mount everest four seconds after that the thermal radiation blast heads outward. Uh, plants are spontaneously combusted. Animals suffer instant third to sixth degree burns at NOLA. Uh, and all life within a radius of about a thousand miles dies instantly. At the three minute mark, the central peak collapses, flooding the crater with lava. Only the outer part of the peak ever got a chance to solidify. The inside was still uh, basically super molten. So the, the crater is now flooded with lava. Uh, it splashes against the periphery and rebounds and uh, it's cooling rapidly. And so the lava splash forms a ring of tall peaks as it solidifies. A little over a minute later, a magnitude 10 plus earthquake strikes New Orleans as the first of the earthquake waves, waves arrives. Uh, 10 seconds later, seismic satius begin to set up in inland waters. A little over a minute after that, the second uh, earthquake wave strikes New Orleans. And about half a minute after that, the, the P wave reaches the Tannis site in North Dakota. So six minutes after impact and the first massive earthquake has hit North Dakota from the Yucatan Peninsula. At the eight minute mark, molten ejecta begins to fall at New Orleans and secondary fires ignite anything that was not burned in the thermal blast. The atmosphere begins to heat up. Uh, an atmospheric shock wave may hit New Orleans. 
20 seconds later, the last of the two uh, earthquake lo waves, Love and Rayleigh surface waves, strike New Orleans for a total quake duration at New Orleans of five to six minutes minimum. At the nine minute mark, uh, there is so much uh, rock ash and smoke in the atmosphere that it begins to dim. The light begins to dim to complete darkness worldwide. At the 10 minute mark, the S wave reaches the Tanis side in North Dakota. At the 13 minute mark, the last of the two, the Love and Rayleigh waves reach the Tanis side in North Dakota for a total quake duration in North Dakota of at least seven minutes. At the 15 minute mark, the first ejecta begins to fall at Tanis. This ignites fires at Tanis. Think of it as a wave of ejecta moving out from the crater and landing worldwide, okay? Because yes, it is going to go worldwide. There will be ejecta that were, that achieved escape velocity. But anything that fell short of escape velocity is going to fall on the opposite side of the planet. At the 20 minute mark, uh, seawater resurges into the crater and surmounts the peak ring, um, carrying about 130 feet worth of impact type debris and depositing it across the crater uh, at 130 foot depth. At the 45 minute mark, another atmospheric shock wave may hit New Orleans. At the one hour mark, uh, the peak ring is completely breached, not just surmounted, but completely broken up in the Northeast by the research. And another 33 feet worth of impact is uh, impact height is deposited. Uh, this is a little bit more rounded, a little bit more sorted. Um, and that means that it has traveled further through the turbulence and had a chance to round off. Uh, at the one minute, one hour, 10 minute mark, the first mega tsunami strikes New Orleans. Remember, mile high. 30 minutes after that, the ejecta has reached the opposite side of the planet and fires are now raging worldwide. At the two minute, at the two hour mark, ejecta has finally stopped falling at New Orleans. But 30 minutes later, the secondary mega tsunamis from the underwater landslides begin to hit. At the three hour mark, the sky gradually lightens to twilight levels and Earth begins to enter a nuclear winter. Uh, it is estimated that this nuclear winter dropped global temperatures by as much as 30 degrees Fahrenheit for anywhere from one year to several decades. Uh, at the five hour mark, the acid rain begins to fall at New Orleans. At the six hour mark, the smallest animals begin to suffer silicosis from ash inhalation very far away from the impact site. Silicosis is a nasty little disease. Um, basically, uh, it's, it's uh, in this particular instance, it, they would have been inhaling what amounts to fiberglass, broken up fiberglass. So it's, it's very sharp little bits of volcanic glass uh, that get down into the lungs and slash holy hell out of the lung tissue. So about a week after the impact, the first animals begin to die of the secondary effects, silicosis and injury. About a month and a third, a month and a quarter into uh, this event, starvation begins to take its toll. And anywhere from one to 50 years later, you finally have the material blocking the sun is finally settling out. Nuclear winter ends and the atmosphere begins to clear. Temperatures begin to warm. Unfortunately, what we have now 
is all of the greenhouse gases that were ejected into the atmosphere by the impact take over and temperatures now soar uh, and we we uh, reach the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum which lasts for another 200,000 years before temperatures begin to cool again. So all said, the total effect of this one impact would have lasted 200,000 years. <clears throat> and remember, we had an impact. We had a mega quake. We had multiple worldwide mega tsunamis. We had a worldwide firestorm. We had worldwide molten ejecta. We had uh, a nuclear winter followed by runaway greenhouse. All from one from one impact. The minimum amount that the global temperatures would have decreased in the nuclear winter would have been around four to five degrees Fahrenheit. It may have been as much as 30 degrees. Photosynthesis would have ceased. You get, you, it's no, there's no sun. It's dark. The plants begin to die. The herbivores that eat the plants begin to starve. The predators that eat the herbivores begin to starve. And eventually, you start getting scavenger effects. So the scavengers, the scavengers initially have a heyday. They've got lots of dead stuff they can eat. What happens when the dead stuff runs out? And once again, as I said, as the ash begins to fall out, the greenhouse gases take over. Um, and so you have, you have uh, a, a, a severe dip followed by uh, an incredible climb. Okay. Britannica.com, huh? I'm going to jump back in here where you're talking about the ash and the gr runaway greenhouse. So, in essence, we're all, we were almost like what Jupiter is today on a runaway greenhouse. Uh, uh, no, it wasn't complete runaway. Um, it would have been Venus, but uh, it, it, there, actually, interestingly enough, <laughs> Once things finally started to rebound, uh, it rebounded nicely, and we had a lot of a lot of, uh, of uh, happy plant matter because of the warm temperatures. But uh, the initial destruction was just incredible. But no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have been. It would have been like quite like Venus. No. Uh, but it would. It, it would have run until an equilibrium was found. Yeah between between uh, heat being absorbed and heat being radiated. Uh, Carl Whitsman added in here, he says, if someone wrote this into a novel, nobody would believe it. Yeah. Uh, and then he added in, it's a wonder I I that anything survived at all. Uh, yeah, it really is. But interestingly enough, and we'll get to that hopefully in a little bit, um, this was not the worst extinction event. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's get on to it then. And okay. I'm going I'm to so, jump back out. Okay. So about thir only about 13% of the plankton remained alive. Uh, entire groups of mollusks were wiped out. Uh, corals were reduced to about a fifth of the species. Uh, that existed prior. Uh, one entire type of bivalve uh, just went away. Uh, there were widespread species extinctions of angiosperms, uh, which are plants, uh, a type of plant. Uh, entire groups of reptiles died out. Uh, some died out before the KT boundary. And these include uh, uh, the flying reptiles and a lot of the sea reptiles. Um, but among the surviving reptile groups 
uh, turtles, crocodilians, lizards, and snakes uh, were only mildly affected. Amphibians and mammals also uh, were relatively mildly affected. Why? Because they were small, didn't take much to eat, and mostly lived underground. Eighty-eight percent of all terrestrial vertebrates were lost. Ten percent of freshwater vertebrates. Uh, incredibly dense dinosaur bone beds, marine bone beds. Uh, the Tanis site has tree, freshwater marine, saltwater marine, and terrestrial fossil beds. Um, and none of these fossil beds shows evidence of scavenging despite having been uh, only very shallowly buried by the ash. And that means that there had been a depletion of scavengers as well in, in the whole cataclysm. And it would have been a cataclysm. Um, of the archosaurs that survived, you have the crocodilians. And the avian dinosaurs. Um, mammals survived. Some amphibians. Some of the smaller reptiles. The very deep water dwellers. Um, the omnivores, insectivores, and scavengers tend to, tended to fare better than, than straight predators or straight herbivores. The first plants to rebound were the ferns. Uh, and that's pretty typical. They're usually the first repopulators after any natural disaster of the sort. Um, but now we're starting to get into, you know, some of the some of the giant ferns and stuff because of the warmth as as the greenhouse gases took over. Um, there are alternate theories. What are these other alternate theories? Well, some statistical studies indicate, based on the fossil record, that most of the dinosaur groups were already in decline during the late Cretaceous. Uh, this does not include the herbivore groups, uh, which actually seem to have been proliferating during that period. Um, and while this particular study... Uh, says that basically what, what they're saying happening was happening at the time was that um, the various and sundry species and groups were were weakened uh, by the inability to replace extinct species with new ones and this left them vulnerable to stressor events. Not everybody agrees that there was even a decline. So that is also in dispute. Uh, we already talked about the deck and traps. Uh, the, the, you're looking at um, you know, 600,000 square miles of land that was covered uh, one, and a, one and a quarter miles deep with lava. That's about 750,000 cubic miles of, of lava over the course of... of uh, of the, the various and sundry eruptions. Um, the, the hypothesis here is that the release of copious ash and carbon and sulfur compound aerosols into the air would have uh, blocked the light and caused uh, a nuclear winter before then turning around and causing the, that runaway greenhouse effect. Um, my problem with this is that traps are generally not highly eruptive. Um, think of, okay, everybody remembers the recent uh, Hawaiian eruption with the long fissures running through the neighborhoods and stuff. Think about that raised uh, in terms of extent, raised a couple of orders of magnitude. And that's, that's what a trap eruption is. I think that getting the ash high enough in the atmosphere to have a worldwide negative effect would have been very difficult. Um, 
arguably the gas components, the greenhouse gas components would have been localized as well, but I can see the argument that it would have been dispersed. Uh, however, the, the plankton study that indicated rapid, rapid ocean acidification uh, indicates that this did not happen in the first three eruptions of the traps. Uh, you would if you would think if it was going to happen, it would happen from the very beginning of the eruption. Uh, apparently, it did not. And remember, the the actual boundary layer is in between the layers of eruption. So the hypothesis that the Deccan traps single-handedly caused it is no longer widely accepted. That said, even the Alvarez has admitted that that huge uh, megaquake, worldwide megaquake, w well could well have contributed to the eruption, as well as to other any active volcanoes elsewhere. So think about adding that into the mix. Every volcano that was had the potential of erupting would have erupted. <laughs> Um, some people have said, no, 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 no. There were multiple impactors. You had the Chicxulub impactor in Mexico, about 180 kilometers across. You had the Bolkish crater in the Ukraine, about 24 kilometers across. You have the Silver Pit crater in the North Sea. It's about 20 kilometers across. You have a proposed crater that we don't even know is really there off the Western India coast, which might be as big as 500 to 600 kilometers across. Uh, but we don't even know if that's real because the Deccan tra Traps overflowed it. And then any other craters in the ancient ocean would have been lost by tectonic movement. Um, if we take all these and we reconstruct the position of the tectonic plates at the time, uh, this would have formed an equatorial swath. So some people are proposing that Earth was hit by a breakup akin to Sh Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hitting Jupiter uh, back in the, I guess it was the 90s. Um, possible. But I mean, if, I mean, look at the size of Chicxulub compared to the others. And we don't even, yeah, Shiva was what would have been way big. But if all of this happened from Chicxulub, uh, Shiva could have been a planet killer if it actually is there at all. Miss Osborne, we got a quick question sure. and commentary. This is from one of our own, Chris Walker. It says, so at least a thousand times more powerful and destructive than the blast at Doom Pompeii. I think that thousand should be hundreds of thousands at this point. Um, probably, yeah. Uh, by, by the way, just throwing this out there, it turns out that Vesuvius is actually part of a super volcano. And the modern city of Naples is sitting in the caldera. Just thought I'd throw that out there. All right. Another possible explanation is something called Maastrichtian sea level regression. Uh, the last age of the Cretaceous period was the Maastrichtian age. And there does appear to be indisputable evidence that the sea levels fell by a substantial margin. Um, and... They don't seem to show the tilting and distortion associated with mountain building. So there may have been a, a drop in sea level. Though we don't know why there would have been one. Um, the currently accepted explanation is that the mid-ocean ridges became less active and sank under their own weight. The problem with this is that the mid-ocean ridges are powered by the convection of the mantle and so and that's part of the whole plate tectonics movement so that has got some some issues in itself because now you're going wait a minute you're saying the mantle slowed down what would have caused that and why would it have ever speeded back up so you've got that problem then you've also got the the consideration that Yes, while this would have wreaked havoc on 
shallow marine animals. It wouldn't have affected the deep, deep water animals. Uh, and it wouldn't have affected land creatures at all. And all of them were drastically affected by the KT extinction. So the Maastrichtian sea level regression is an insufficient explanation. And so then you've also got the people that are like, oh, well, it's multiple choice. So you pick one from column A, one from column B, one from column C, until you have sufficient conditions for the extinction. Um, the thing of it is, and this is, this, is, this is my logic coming to the fore here, okay? A sufficient condition is a sufficient condition. If the impact itself wasn't enough, you had the thermal blast. If the thermal blast wasn't enough, you had the multiple, you had the, uh, the uh, megaquake. If the megaquake wasn't enough, you had the worldwide multiple mega tsunamis. If that wasn't enough, you had the, the underwater uh, mega slides. If that wasn't enough, you had um, uh, the, 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 the worldwide firestorm. If that wasn't enough, you had the, uh, the nuclear winter. If that wasn't enough, you had the silicosis. If that wasn't enough, you had the, the resulting... You know, at what point do you say enough's enough? This, this was a titanic worldwide catastrophe. So what you're saying is it basically created its own Goldilocks scenario by being so many catastrophic events and, and styles of events all in the same time. Yeah, and I mean, most of those occurred within hours. And some within minutes, so there was no way yeah. for us to rebound as a planet. Chris oh, yeah. Walker also jumped in and asked one quick question. How did Vesuvius blast at Doom Pompeii and the Krakatoa eruption compare to one another? I'm assuming on their level of destruction and their catastrophic nature um, to the planet itself. I would need to look up the relative um, volcanic explosivity index of, of the two eruptions. Um, but um, Krakatoa gotcha. was, was bigger. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Um, I can try and do that here shortly once I finish this. Absolutely. Um, so we've got that. And, and you know, Chicxulub is far from being the only impact site. It's also far from being uh, the only extinction event. Um, notice that you have, th these are the top, the top five extinction events. There are others. Uh, notice that you have one, the Permian-Triassic extinction event, was known as the Great Dying. You're talking at better than 90% of everything alive at that time died. Um, so here are those extinction events, and here are some possible causes put forward uh, for each of them, the Ordovician Silurian extinction event. There were there were two separate events, uh, kind of back to back there, um, and one of the possibilities is a gamma ray burst for that one. It was it was pretty bad, uh, but it was relatively early on. Um, the Villui traps, um, another another uh, trap supervolcano uh, in what is now Russia, uh, is purported to be the cause of the late Devonian extinction, which was not huge. Uh, and then you have the Great Dying, and uh, once again, notice you, the S Siberian traps are a possibility, but then you've got another impact event. Wilkes Land is in Antarctica. Antarctica was not in, at, was not in Antarctica <laughs> when that happened. Um, in other words, it was not uh, South Polar. Um, and then there's something called an anoxic event, uh, which is kind of complex. It, it involves trapping the oxygen chemically so that it's not available for, for the, the animals. And then you have the Triassic-Jurassic event. And uh, again, you have uh, the Central Atlantic Ma Magmatic Province, and that's another trap uh, event. And once again, you have a possible impactor. Uh, and then you have the KT event. Uh, 
So those are, uh, and and there's by by most counts, there's at least about 25 total extinction events uh, in the course of the geologic record. Um, most are considered to be caused by either some sort of supervolcano event or impact events. Uh, the list of you can find a list of all of those on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is is a good jumping off place. Um, so far, I've I've in the geology and in the astronomy and physics, they're generally pretty good. Occasionally, I find some glitches in the astronomy stuff. Uh, but you know, if, if you're sticking with with some some basic things like this. It's a good jumping off point. Uh, I use it sometimes in these sorts of things simply because it tends to be a an easy read for the non-scientist. So um, I, if, if you want more information, I do have the ebook out there. Uh, I can cram more into an ebook than I can possibly cram into a one to two hour talk. So, um, and this actually started out as a one hour talk and I found that I got so many questions that I asked Joe if I could have two hours. So, and he said yes. So, and yeah, notice the cheeseburger. <laughs> the cheeseburger is wonderful. <laughs> yes. Um, so, there's there's the ebook. Uh, it's available in, for Kindle and Nook. And go have a go have a look, please. Uh, and here are some of my other um, ebook science ebooks. Um, Kiss your ash goodbye is about the Yellowstone supervolcano. It contains a lot of information about supervolcanoes in general, including much of the material that that I mentioned today. Uh, Rock and roll is about the New Madrid fault system, which is a, a series of faults. It runs under, basically under the Mississippi River. Uh, everybody's heard of the San Andreas Fault. Very few people know about the New Madrid. Um, and it's actually more powerful and <laughs> has the potential for taking down a significant portion of the country if it goes in a big way. And so, that is is your panel tomorrow afternoon. Is yes, that correct? Is. Yes, uh, From 3 until 5, am I? I believe I so, yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't have the No, wait, schedule. wait, wait. No, that was today, wasn't it? No, if I, what? This Hang is. On. I've got it. <laughs> I've got uh, it. From five to seven was today's panel. Yeah, yeah from three three to five tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm going to actually overwork you tomorrow because we got a, uh, uh, you've got your two hour panel and then you're doing a follow up panel. Yes. Uh, just after that. A little little fun and games. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. that, that's what I'm looking for. And Carl Whitsman says he needs the new Madrid book. So that would be an ebook on Amazon or Yeah, Am it's available on Amazon and barnesnoble.com. It's Kindle and Nook. Whichever one he's got is is he can get. Okay. Now to give you an idea of the sort of research I do for these things. Three, <laughs> four, four and a half pages of so, barely anything, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Ruth says she absolutely enjoyed your talk about the New Madrid Fault a couple of years ago. And that's good. the one tomorrow. So that's going to be a real good one. So, All righty. So I'm, I'm gonna, back. Yeah. And so do um, do we have any more questions? Yeah. If anybody's got any quick questions now, we can start fielding the questions. We got about 10, 10 minutes to let Stephanie talk. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. It looks like Car Mr. Carl Witzman has a little something for us. Um, hold on. Here we go. It says, people who argue against impactors they are more protecting of their own little science domains, like a paradigm shift or protecting their funding flow. Uh, yeah, it's it's their pet theories. That's that's what I'm um, 
scientists are just like anybody else. We are, uh, once, once we reach a certain age, we become resistant to change. Um, and so we, we get, um, we get inured in a given way of thinking about things. And we don't want to, uh, we don't want to be forced to change our minds. This is the way it always has been. This is what it's supposed to be. Who are you to come up and, and say that it didn't happen at all like that? And Carl has a point. and says, we'd like to argue. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, sometimes the arguments are fun. And sometimes they're not so much. <laughs> but remember, um, when I started off, I explained about uh, uniformitarianism and catastrophism. And, and that's kind of part of it. Because uh, I, you can almost say that, that the concept of a trap eruption causing these extinction events yeah, it's it's an event unto itself, but trap eruptions go on and on and on and on and on. They're very big, very long life. They produce a lot of lava. They produce they produce gases, volcanic gases and stuff. And so then the gases get in the atmosphere and they mingle, and 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 they start this this uh, you know ramping up to to greenhouse stuff. And so you can really almost argue that what you have going with uh, deck and traps versus Chicxulub impactor is uniformitarianism versus catastrophism. So, you know, it, and my take, I mean, from the moment my professors started talking about the, the whole uniformitarianism versus catastrophism debate, which, again, started in the Victorian era, um, or at least in the 1800s. Um, I sat there and I looked at him and I was like, it's both. It's neither, it's neither one. It's all of it together. You have, you have some some uh, factors that are long period, long term, like erosional forces. And you have other things that are very abrupt and cataclysmic, like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and asteroid impacts and things like that. So it, you, can't, you can't get there from here on one or the other. You got you to gotta have... You got to have the horses riding in tandem in order to pull the cart. It's it's that simple, you know. Yeah, Carl Whitsman added in, it's sort of like, you new guys need to get off my scientific lawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's a, um, it's the, there's, there's a huge, there's been a huge debate going on for a couple decades now over in Egypt. Because, you know, the Egyptologists have things all, and which is a branch of archaeology, have things yeah. all laid out about how they, they, they think that the, uh, the Egyptian dynasties went and everything and, and who built what and all this kind of stuff. And then a geologist comes in and he says, no, wait a minute. You've got something going on here with the Sphinx. There's signs of water erosion. That didn't happen during those time frames. It had to happen during this time frame. Yeah. Uh, and then, oh, they they tried they they tried to uh, uh, run them out on rails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, they tried to exclude him from the site. I think they uh, did exclude him from the site. Yeah, a Facebook user. Uh, you gonna have to answer up. that one, Joe. I don't yeah. know. Just got in about 10 minutes ago. Will this be available later? Actually, right now, this is recorded and being broadcast directly to Stephanie's page. So just as soon as we click in, give it about five minutes, you can watch the whole presentation again on Stephanie Osborne's page. And then it will also be saved to YouTube and all our Facebook pages. Uh as replays, and I'm not going to delete them, so they will be up from now on for 
YouTube, Facebook, all that for the full Halicon. And then the uh, it'll stay on Stephanie Osborne's page as long as she wants it there. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank and, you, dog. I appreciate that. All right. And uh, Kimberly Tuttle just said that was absolutely fascinating. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And, this, uh, uh, this was kind of right up my alley because um, I have I have studied um, asteroid impacts literally for decades. It's uh, initially as as something of a hobby, and then it kind of ramped up a little bit because people were very very interested. I was working the space program during the Comet Shoemaker Levy Nine impact of of Jupiter, and uh, and so it kind of ramped up. I got a lot of interest there. And then I wound up, at one point, I wound up on an asteroid impact mitigation working group uh, team. So I, I've done a lot of this sort of thing over the years. Uh, so this is, kind of, this is kind of one of my little specialties. And Bill Tuttle said, thank you so much. That was amazing. And, uh, of course, Carl jumped in. Like, uh, I'm not going to even attempt that Belikowski. one. Belikowski. Belikowski. Idea of planetary collisions were derided, but now we're thinking some of it wasn't all bunk. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, a lady named Susan Basham says, great presentation as always. Hi, Susan. And we are going to sort of wrap this one up because right. uh, we got to cross the streams. You know what happens when you cross the streams? Everything oh, yeah. dies. So uh, uh, unmute your mic, John. That picture I showed earlier yes. of the crater thing, that's on Google Maps. Oh, really? Just okay. type in uh, the, the tri what is it, uh, Chitsalub. Okay. Uh, just type in Chitsalub crater, and that comes up in the pictures on the side of the Google Maps. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, I got your website scrolling across the bottom of the screen. Yep. Uh, Please www. Go check me out. Yeah, www. Stephanie-Osborne.com. Check it out. It's a great website. Uh, I'm going to run a couple commercials real quick. Uh, and then we're waiting on the next crew to jump in, come in at 7. Well, I haven't heard from him. Our 7 o'clock. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to be filling time because our 7 o'clock panel has canceled. Um, now, was that the one that I was supposed to be in? No, 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 no. Uh, that's at 8 o'clock. Are you talking about the Oracle or the yes. table? Or Oracle's at, at 8. Okay. Um, Which is 7 you, my time. Okay. 7 your time. Just come back to this, this link you used right here. Okay. All right. So we're going to run a few commercials. Uh, jump streams a couple times and then uh, we'll be right back. And Carl says, very informative, thanks. And Oracle is at eight. All right, uh, let's start running a few commercials. Stephanie, you can go ahead and leave leave studio if you wish. Or... Okie dokie. All right, mm -hmm. let me get that. And uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Now we're going to help pay a few bills. Uh, thanks everybody, and we'll see y'all in just a few minutes.
Dr. Megan McAllister was already pretty unusual when she encountered the man in the black suit that night. What Division One Agent Echo didn't know was that she was even more special, but he'd find out soon enough. Stephanie Osborne uses the urban legend of operatives who show at UFO sightings and make things disappear to craft her vision of the universe we don't know. The Division One series chronicles this via Recruit Omega and experienced partner Echo as they handle everything from lost children to alien assassination and more. Book One, Alpha and Omega, is available in print and ebook from your favorite bookseller. Hey guys, it's Angel with Immortal Impressions doing the vir- virtual thing for Halicon 2020. Um, y'all can visit us at Four Immortal Impressions on Facebook. Send us a private message. We can handle all of your ceramic, sewing, 3D printing, masks, costumes, and all the other goodies that we have. And we'll be glad to take care of you. Y'all have a good con and a good year.